brought to you by MyRidingCoach.com. Uh, welcome everyone, thanks for being here today. I hope you've enjoyed some shopping and all of the spoils that are available. Um, now, those of you who know me know that I tend to go off in tangents when I talk about things because I could talk about any one of these things you're going to see here today for a whole day. So really this is, as with every presenter today, a little bit of a uh, an overview of things and what I'm aiming to do is just get you to change the way you think about something that you've probably heard many, many times. So. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I've been introduced very well, but yes, I am Jackie Van Montfrans from Forward Coaching, and yes, we've just launched a new website, which is for online training. Uh, I'm not actually going to teach you how to train on the internet. <laughs> you can go and visit the website and, uh, and have a look at how that goes, but um, I'll have a bit more of a talk about that at the end if we have time. If we run out of time, I'm happy to field some questions, and you can ask me whatever you like about it. Okay. So we've had a little bit, we don't have a little clicker, so I have to just, ah, there we go. Okay, so I have to uh, just manually go through this. So if I, if I miss a slide or to click through, just give me a wave and let me know I haven't changed the slide up there. All right, so uh, that's me. Um, and then we've got this one here. So the, riding, um, the rider's training scale. Essentially what I want to talk to you about is how you can improve your skill set by applying the training scale to your own riding. If, when you think about the scale, and some of you may have listened to the webinar I ran on the dynamic training scale, um, you need to think of it as a dynamic process. So as much as we'll see it listed as one, two, three, four, five, six, it is dynamic and it is multidimensional. Um, all I want you to start thinking about is how you can take those same concepts through to your own writing and uh, how the basics, which you're always hearing about the basics, how the basics can apply to you as much as they can your horse. All right, so just a, a very brief overview of the training scale for those of you who are sort of familiar with it or perhaps not, but just a, a, a very um, quick one on uh, the dynamic training scale that, uh, that I've spoken about before. So the first one is you're creating foundation with the basics. And, oops, I've just pressed something wrong, see? There we go. So number one being rhythm. Number two being suppleness and relaxation of the back. So rhythm also incorporates regularity, suppleness and relaxation of the back. And number three being contact, yeah, or acceptance of the bridle. So these three things to me are the foundation of the basics. And then from there, you build on those foundations by working on forwardness and straightness. Those two things allow you to create throughness in your horse. And then from there, remember this is a very summarized version of a lot of information, but this is my objective, is to simplify it so that when you're on your horse, you're not trying to think about too many things all at once. And then from there, I think I might have pressed something wrong. Ah, so from there, if we add together those things, so the basics, which is one, two, and three, yeah, so rhythm, suppleness, contact. We add to that four and five, which gives you then the throughness. From there, you can develop your collection. Now, once that's happened, you check in with the basics all over again. So that's why this is cyclical. It doesn't just happen that you do one, two, three. Great, basics are done. Let's move on. You always revisit them. So a good example of that might be um, a prelim novice horse and you're wanting to move through to doing some laterals and you start to do some of the exercises which makes them lateral ready or for lateral readiness. And you have to check in again with, am I maintaining the rhythm? Is the horse staying soft and supple and over the back? Yeah. And do I have an acceptance of the connection? And until that happens, you're not going to push the horse to be more forward and straighter and more collected within that next level up until 
they can make that one, two, three sit on top of that one through to six that you've done before. Yep. Okay. So that's an overview of the training scale as we would apply it to the horse. So the rider's training scale, essentially what it's doing is giving you a system. And this sport is so feel oriented that it's really quite difficult sometimes to uh, make it something more tangible. And I think all of you would have been in the situation where you're in the arena, the emotions are running high, you just don't know what to do anymore, it becomes really, really frustrating, and you don't have a reference point. I'm about to go off on a tangent again, so let me stick with this. So I want you to think creating a system to improve your skill set, which in includes how you think about things, and give the training scale a new context. So why do we create a system? Uh, a system does a number of things. So it's going to provide you again with this foundation that I've just talked about in the training scale. And from there, you can build a broader and then deeper uh, understanding. The other thing a system does is it can simplify, it doesn't mean it's simple, but it can simplify something very, very complex. I don't know if you guys are aware, but at the most, we're able to hold a maximum of seven things in our conscious mind. Seven, it's not actually very many. And then, you know, when you're writing, some of your sensory awarenesses, that's already taking up part of that space. So by simplifying the complex, you can take it into the arena with you. And then you get these logic, what I call logical markers to refer to when those emotions tend to cloud your judgment. You can actually go, hang on a second, I'm doing that thing again where I'm getting all worked up about it. Have I got three? Am I trying to ask for six? Am I doing two? Yeah, so you can kind of put numbers to it. All right. Okay, and then from there, when you have that clarity, you provide space to create new experiences in your writing and you can make them conscious so they can fill one of those seven spaces that are useful to you. All right. So none of what I'm saying is new. We're just giving it a slightly different context. So if I was to say to you, right, number one is rhythm in the training scale. For me, the rider holds the rhythm in the seat. The seat is the metronome, okay? So that's your number one. Number two, for suppleness and relaxation of the back, you need to think of yourself as being able to hinge and move. I, for some of you who watched the Seven Myths presentation a couple of years ago or might have seen it online, uh, we talk a lot about hinges and anchors and so on, but you need to think of yourself as having hinges in order to have suppleness in your body. Then contact or acceptance of the bridle, yeah, um, that concept of contact comes into the seat and leg connection as well. It isn't just the rein contact, which means your anchors are where you literally can anchor, where you can hold. There has to be something that holds. There is such a thing as positive tension. So you need to become aware of where you're allowed to hold. We become a little bit paranoid about this thing of don't grip, don't grip. You've got to hold on somewhere, trust me. <laughs> All right. Then the fourth one is forwardness in our training scale. And again, if you think of forwardness as fueling everything, creating some energy, really... Um, uh, you know, if you were to think of it as a vehicle, you've got all of your components and then you have to add fuel for it to go. Number five, straightness. I like to think of it with the horses as uprightness and so for ourselves as riders we need to think of alignment and I don't want to go into a whole talk about how mass works and you know things have to be aligned for mass to be the most effective but essentially the more aligned you are the more the horse can stay upright underneath you and then number six collection 
I want you to think of that in your own body as a direction you're creating with the horse. Now I'm going to expand a little bit more on each of these things, but that gives you the overview of how I would relate the training scale for the horses to you guys as riders. So seat as rhythm. These are great drawings by, uh, I've got an author's reference somewhere, but they're, they're really beautiful drawings. Um, so if you think again of your seat as the control center for rhythm and regularity, um, most of you would know what a metronome is. You know, if you've got to do the music thing, you've got to go tick, 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 and without rhythm, you actually don't have anything because you can't develop timing. And as a rider, you're essentially wanting to improve your timing and where you can improve your timing, you can say a lot more to your horse in the same space of time. All right. So, hinges and suffling. Right, so there are your moving parts, okay? So you have to move through your lower back. You have to have allowance in your elbows. There has to be a little bit of give in your wrists, all right? There needs to be softness in your ankles. This whole heels down business. One of the first things I do when a rider is stiff in the saddle is I tell them to pull their heels up and point their toes down. I know that sounds weird, but I want the elasticity or the moving part to come through, and that is through the ankles, that you can, can um, absorb some of the movement that's happening underneath you. So in other words, you need to know as a rider where to let go, um, and you know, identifying where you naturally hold on. So, Everyone holds their center of gravity naturally somewhere, and everyone's a little different depending on your build and um, you know, your own biomechanics, and just becoming aware of where you naturally hang on, where maybe you shouldn't be, that's already the first part to getting to know how to create more suppleness in your body. We're not talking you know, that you have to be a gymnast or a, one of those yoga people that does all the you know, great stretchy things. Um, but you do need to ride with what I call a relaxed tension. So think of a dancer or, a, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're able to be very supple, but boy, oh boy, you know, they're strung like you're stretching an elastic band. It's just they know where to let go and how to absorb all of the movement. The key, I think, for this whole thing of suppleness, and that it will tie in again to the alignment, is that you need to think to create length in your body for the hinges to move. So as soon as you're crunching down trying to make something happen, you're blocking your hinges. So the first part to creating any kind of suppleness is to think to create length in your body. And where you can create length, you give the room for things to move. Yep. So that would be if you did nothing other then went, okay, I'm imagining someone's putting their hand on my chest, so do it now. Grab your hand, push it there, and now go, ooh, right? And now from there, breathe out really hard. That's it, okay? So that's this thing of lengthening, but lowering your center, and I'll talk a bit more about lowering your center of gravity. So when you combine this concept of uh, anchors and your center of gravity. So we just did an exercise in lowering your center of gravity. Um, did you got, were any of you here when we did the prayer position thing? No? Yeah, okay. So that's another one, you know, that if you just push your palms together, yeah, and then push your elbows down, um, that, and then breathe out into that, then release the palms, but keep the tension here. That's another way of lowering your center, all right? And creating positive tension. Okay, so when you're um, thinking of number three being contact, you want to combine contact with elasticity or suppleness and a low center of gravity, and then you create connection with your horse. So within that, that concept of basics, you have to, you have to think of creating a connection with your horse. So it's like having the mobile phone that keeps dropping out. If you don't have a good connection, you can't get your message through. 
So you create the connection, then you can start having a really cool conversation with your horse. Yep. All right, so the, um, the, one of the things that I want you to, to differentiate between is softness and lack of contact. Now, those of you who I've worked with, I always talk about, you know, the give, uh, giving some release point, showing the horse where that space is, where they can release. But it's not just dropping the contact because you can actually end up pulling more when you have no contact to a sudden contact. You actually have to um, develop that ability to give and be elastic but still hold that balance point into your centre. All right. And again, there's lots of cool exercises that you can do to do that, but I think I've got to keep going. <laughs> okay. Then we've got... Um, with this whole idea of uh, contact, that you need to have your horse think of accepting it or accepting it rather than avoiding it. So uh, an example of that might be when the horse learns to be very obedient by tucking their head down and they've avoided the contact and you go, oh, my horse is soft, but really they've just learned to avoid the contact and they're probably avoiding your seat then you're wondering why you can't get good transitions, why the head flicks up all of a sudden when, you know, they're all soft down here and then flick. What's going on? They're nice and soft. They're on the bit, but they're not. They're just avoiding the contact. Yep. Um, and, and you need to think of this in your own body as how, how you can create this power, uh, the, yeah, like a, a plug-in effect to a power point with, with your, your seat and your hips. So, remember the triangle we had before with one, two, and three for the basics? Yep. For me in the rider, one, two, and three combined creates balance and connection. So you have your seat, you have your hinges, you have your anchors, and you have that ability to lower your centre of gravity. Then we're going to create the energy, so we're going to add the fuel. And this can be termed as forwardness, impulsion. Um, but in you, this ability to add energy, again, comes from this ability to lower your center, feel like you're squeezing everything in and, and creating almost like a combustion effect to be able to drive your horse. And it's as though the only place that you invite your horse to be is in front of the leg or in front of the seat because that's where it, the release happens, okay? When you add energy to the equation, it doesn't mean going faster. Otherwise, you become like the little mouse on the treadmill, push, 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 push but you go nowhere. Um, I guess most of you would have seen Piaf and Passage being ridden, very forward moving, move, oh, very forward types of movement but it's not fast, okay? The other one is for you to think, to point to your destination before you hit the accelerator. So have a think about it. Um, how did you get here today? You knew you wanted to get to QSEC. But if you were pointing to Sydney and just hit the accelerator and went, oh, eventually, eventually I'll get to QSEC in Caboolture, doesn't matter how hard you accelerate, you haven't got a direction to where you're accelerating to. So create a direction as well by pointing to your destination. Uh, I, um, Jenny this morning was talking about following your lines. That's a classic one. Just hold your body to the line or the pattern that you're riding. And then you fuel the engine, which again is this positive tension. Um, you can imagine you're being tickled. Yep. So again, if you sit up, do this chest thing. Breathe out nice and strong. And then give it like a sharp <sighs> breath. Or, oh, yep. And that's this. <sighs> now the other one that people kind of don't want to talk about because it's awkward is all of your pelvic floor muscles. Suck them up. Yep. Seriously. It's the only way you hold. You've got to think of your body like a dice, like it has six sides. And you've got to contain the energy into that 
point in your body and then the horse goes forward. From there, your seat again holds the revs and allows for the gear changes. So you might hold the horse a little more on the spot or you might let the horse travel on. And that comes back to, are you going to use more anchor or more hinge? Now the rider alignment, and I know we all hear this thing, you have to sit straight, you have to sit straight. Um, but again, think of yourself as multi-dimensional. You're not just sitting straight in one direction. There's various directions you have to think about your straightness. And you also have to think about where your horse is naturally putting you. So you know those toasted sandwich makers, you know the jaffle machine things or whatever they are, and you squeeze them all together and then the filling falls out? Yeah, you don't want that. <laughs> you want the sandwich to sit nicely in there that when you push it together all the edges seal nicely and you don't get any cheese out of the side and you know it just that's how you have to think about yourself so that when you're on the horse you don't want any you know any of the filling falling out. <laughs> the other one that I like to think of is that to sit deeper or to sit down you have to sit up. So again, the more you sit up, the more space you create, like a nice funnel or channel for your centre to drop down into. So if you need to, if you're in there going, I just can't get down into the saddle, do not crunch. Think planking, not crunching. <laughs> All right. Then you keep the energy in the grid. So that's all I'm talking about with this whole thing of don't let the, the stuffing fall out, is you're putting energy back into the grid all the time. And again, I won't go on about this, but that you know, you create this figure of eight energy pattern within the horse and you're sitting right in the middle of it, constantly feeding that. So the foundations you've now built on, you've got your one, two, three, you add your energy, you add your alignment to that basic. From that, you're creating efficiency and effectiveness. You know, you watch some riders and they can ride and they can talk and they might get a little bit puffed because they're not in their natural breathing rhythm because they're talking, but they can kind of get on, get off, have their breath back within a fairly short space of time and away they go. It's because they're efficient and effective so that they're putting minimum effort for maximum results. And the more you can start to uh, have that sort of effect, again, you have more time to get more results, but with less effort. But if you're wasting your, your energy on wrestling with all of the, oh, I can't do it, this is awful, why is my horse not doing this for me, why do I even bother riding, you know, all that stuff that ends up in your head, that's, you're filling up too much space. So then when we think about collection, you're thinking about, again, the direction that you're wanting to bring the horse. Um, again, this whole concept of sucking it up. <laughs> if you, again, if you tell yourself nothing other, suck it up. The only one that knows you're doing it is you and your horse. <laughs> All right? But it is a good one to remember. And I think that's where, uh, for a lot of riders, they're not able to hold their hip and pelvic position because they don't think to draw those lower abdominal muscles up and on. All right. I could tell you a little thing I was told once, but it might be a bit rude. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right, so if you're sitting in the bathtub, am I allowed to be rude? All right, if, if you're sitting in the bathtub and you fart, which way do the bubbles go? Yeah, so you, well, you want them to come out the front. <laughs> you don't want the bubbles up your back, right? <laughs> so that's how I want you to think when you're on your horse and you're tipping your pelvis, it's like, oh, bubbles. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you'll never forget that one, will you? <laughs> All right, and then from there, once you've got the bubbles going in the right direction, you need to think of being on a carousel horse. That you can actually, as you're working towards collection, you're thinking about creating a carousel horse ride, that your horse is starting to use much more carrying power rather than only push power. Again, another whole subject all on its own. 
I think I'm actually doing quite well. I haven't gone off on too many tangents yet. So my philosophy is if you do it first, your horse will follow. If they are not logical creatures, they are reactors or responders, and your job is to turn them into responders rather than reactors. Yeah. Um, if you can get your horse to trust you enough to respond to something rather than only react, sometimes you might have to create a reaction to kind of wake them up a bit or make a point. But your job as a rider is to create responses. And for that, you have to be responsible for what your own body does. So you first and your horse will follow. Right, so what I've done is race through that a little bit because I actually want to field some questions rather than me just talking to you guys. Um, you can give me some scenarios of what might have been happening for you in the arena, some riding things that you might want to you know, have me apply to this scale. Um, but coming back on what Liz was talking about earlier, the My Riding Coach website is actually designed to do these types of things, is give you very specific exercises, there's, um, there's a 12 week better rider program that just takes you through on a weekly basis how you can address all of these things about how your hinges and anchors work and it just gives you small amounts of information that you can uh, absorb, take it into the arena so you get a little audio lesson with it as well, you get the little video to watch, you get diagrams, you get articles and you get to educate yourself and then give it a go in the arena because it's right there on your phone. You just put your phones in and away you go. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of the time your own confidence in what you're doing is what gets in the way of the results that you're you know, maybe not getting. Yeah. So when you have the confidence, you can create the connection. And when you create the connection, you can have the conversation that you're after with the horse. Yeah. So has anyone got any questions or any thing that they've experienced when they've been in the arena that they find deeply frustrating and can't quite get their head around or has everyone gone really shy? Has anyone got a really good joke that's better than my story? <laughs> no? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's exactly right. Yes. Yes. And it's a good point. Mirrors are great, but you need to know how to read what you've seen in the mirror and then what to do about it. Um, but the, the, as I say, if you did nothing but one or two of these things and just do the feedback, allow the feedback to come back to you. If I just sit up a bit here and do this lowering of center of gravity, what response does my horse give? If I just do this thing of the prayer position and then release that pressure that way and only let it go that way, what does my horse do? Yeah, And they're, they're incredible creatures, what they will respond to. But we're kind of noisy half the time, trying to make it happen. If we just get a bit quiet, it's like if I whisper, Yep. But if I'm here going, and you're like, oh my God, can she just turn it down and shut up for a moment? Yep. So you'll either teach your horse otherwise to avoid, uh, to block uh, all this passive resistance that happens when you constantly push, 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 push. If you get to trust a system, nothing goes right all the time it's not an instant fix it's a progression it's a journey it can be whatever you need it to be you don't really ever get to the finish line when you're riding yeah it's just it's this constant thing that you marvel at how little a horse can respond to even just an outward breath yes on oh, your pockets yep <laughs> Yeah, because what you've done is you've, you've created the space where you want them to go and the pressure where you don't want them to go. So I often think of this thing of getting the horse in front of the leg. It's actually your whole body is almost like this wall that says, you know, when you're, when you're not there, there's a whole lot of pressure here. Yep. And then 
as soon as they find that space to what I call lift the wither, and you've created that space by just kind of drawing your front bum off the saddle a little bit, they can have that space to lift the wither and go to the rein. But if you're crunched down or tipped forward or leaning back too far, and you again create passive resistance, avoidance, all of those other things, you haven't, you've got one of those dodgy mobile phone kind of connection things going. They sort of, most of the time, most horses actually want to do the job for you. Um, we just have to do it first. <laughs> yep. All right, anyone else have any questions? I can't believe it. Oh, <laughs> okay, let's go to say. Yes. For you or the horse? Yep, yep. Yeah. So when, whichever way she bends her neck too much, use more outside leg. And whichever way they don't bend enough, make sure your inside thigh is down really long and don't jam your lower leg on trying to push them out because all they do is tilt their shoulders more and make the quarters go out more, okay? So this thing of, of overbending is obviously use the outside rein as well, but you're almost, it depends again, sometimes they also curl the quarters in if they bend too much that way, in which case it, you have to play with it. If in doubt, move about, yep. Don't repeat the same thing over and over and over, harder and harder and harder, thinking you might get a different result. Just play with it and go, oh, you know what? I'm not going to break the horse if I just shift her into a bit of counterflexion, move the quarters away a little bit, do the come back and go on, because that's the always that rebalancing moment that they're allowed to have. Yeah, because if where you are just in push mode, it ends in tears. So. She just stops, yeah. So this thing, that, that she's feeling out of balance, yeah. So move her around. A moving horse or an adjustable horse will keep moving for you. What's that? It's your hinges, yeah. Inadvertently, probably when you feel her start to go, no, you're going, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Whereas if you go, oh, I'm going to stay a moving target, you know those... Um, those video games where you have like a crosshair and you've, you've got to lock on to something. I don't know, I did the years ago as a kid and, and like once you've locked on, it goes, blip, 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 boom, got you. But the more the target moves, you can't lock on. So the more you are moving, your hinges are moving and you're keeping the elasticity and the quickness, the less she can lock on to you. Yep, yeah, good question. All right. Anyone else? How am I going for time? Do I have to wrap it up? I have to wrap it up? Okay. Anyone else have a question? As you can tell, I kind of like talking about this stuff. <laughs> okay. I'm going to be out there for a few minutes anyway, so if you want to come and ask me some questions out there, I'm more than happy to have a yuck. Um, but thank you all for coming, and um, would love your feedback as well on the website, because this is actually about you guys and delivering something that's of use to you, so pop us an email and let me know what you think. All right. Thanks, guys.
brought to you, brought to you by my riding coach.